be discussing about uh, Indian reality and insulin initiation, choosing an insulin with uh, efficacy, safety, and convenience. So this uh, uh, symposium is supported uh, by No Nordisk and uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, the product, uh, right? And I'll be talking on the No Nordisk slides. So this is going to be the agenda of my presentation. So I'll start with the uh, conundrum of type two diabetes management in India. So how it is uh, different. So in other words, uh, uh, what are the challenges uh, we face in uh, treating uh, type two diabetes in India? And what are the differences as compared to the Western population? And then I will be talking about insulin in initiation, innovation of two in one solution for total control. So I'll be harping upon uh, the total control of uh, fasting plasma glucose, post endial glucose, as well as the A1C control and insulin therapy in local clinical practice, making choice of an effective, safe and convenient option. So these are the three agendas I'll be talking in next 15-20 minutes. So first, uh, let me start with uh, key realities of managing diabetes in India. So what are the uh, challenges or realities uh, we are facing in managing uh, diabetes in our country and uh, the factors uh, that can impact the choice of uh, therapy for insulin initiation in our uh, patients are the high carb diet. I'll be showing some statistics uh, regarding the carb consumption in our country and uh, I'll also show you slides regarding the high postprandial glucose levels in our population and uh, patients uncontrolled on multiple ovaries. So this is a very common scenario that uh, patients uh, uh, we treat in OPD, they come on three OADs, four OADs, or even five OADs with uh, HP avances of uh, nine or 10, and still they are reluctant to take insulin and need for simplicity and convenience. So when I'm talking of our population, our population is not uh, very receptive for uh, a very complicated therapy. So if you straight away advise a basal plus or basal bolus therapy, which involves multiple injections and uh, multiple pricks, then the patient uh, do not accept uh, that uh, therapy very readily. And uh, they need uh, something which should be simple and which should be convenient to them. So can we address this unmet needs uh, in our population by any means. So that's going to be my focus on discussion. So first, I will focus on high carbohydrate diet in our population. So this is uh, the statistics or survey from the general population of our country. And it was uh, carried out across all the regions, East, West, North, South and Central India. And uh, you can see the orange bars are the bars uh, which represent the carbohydrates and 60 to 70 percent energy intake in our population is through carbohydrates uh, present in the diet. So we Indians, uh, we are high carb consumers. And uh, there are various studies and uh, they, all these studies shows uh, that uh, our population, our diabetic population is having high post glucose levels and high HPL So here you can see uh, the uh, gray bars are the fasting plasma glucose bar, the blue bars are the post glucose uh, bars. And you can see across various studies, the IDCI trial, the DAC trial, the Evans uh, G trial, the present trial and the improved trial, all the trials show that uh, the mean HPA1C of the population varies from 8.5 to 9.5 percent, depending on the trial and the period of time it was carried out. And uh, we have a significant burden of hypoglycemia. See the postprandial values uh, are always uh, about 200 in all the trials. So it ranged, in fact, from uh, 200 to around 219 different trials. So uncontrolled hyperglycemia in India demands timely treatment optimization and insulin therapy that offers total control. So total control, again, I will stress is uh, the control which targets uh, both fasting and post prandial hyperglycemia. So unlike Western population, post glucose should be controlled 
at all levels of HPA1C patients. So we know in the Western population, uh, we had uh, a data from Monier et al, which showed that at lower levels of hyperglycemia, the contribution of uh, postprandial glucose was more significant as compared to fasting plasma glucose, which is true for our population also. So in our population also, a higher contribution of postprandial glucose at lower A1C levels, similar to the uh, population data from Monier et al. But what is different uh, in our population, in our Asian population is that there is a significant contribution from postprandial glucose, even at higher HP A1C levels. And unlike the population data from Monier et al, which showed that uh, at higher HP A1C levels, uh, the contribution of fasting plasma glucose is higher as compared to the postprandial glucose. So, Thus, initiating the with the basal insulin serve the purpose for total control in our population with the knowledge of uh, the challenges uh, we face in management of uh, diabetes in our uh, country and in our scenario. So, can once a daily insulin, basal insulin, be suitable in case of high carb diet? The answer is obvious no, because it won't address the uh, glycemic surge. Uh, following high carb diet. Uh, does it offer direct control of postprandial glucose? No. The basal insulins are meant to control the fasting plasma glucose. They don't contribute significantly to postprandial glucose control. Can it be suitable in case of delayed insulin therapy? No, because a case of delayed insulin therapy is a case of uh, insulin intensification, not insulin initiation. So, basal uh, insulin alone may not be sufficient to bring down the HbA1c in the target range. And uh, will it offer convenience at insulin initiation itself with direct total, that is both fasting and post glucose control? The answer is no, because we know that the basal insulin, they address the fasting hyperglycemia very well, but it's uh, not going to address the post hyperglycemia issue. And uh, this is uh, some statistics from non-Asian and Asians given basal insulin and percentage of uh, patients achieving a A1C of less than 7. So in uh, non-Asian patients, uh, the proportion is uh, significantly high at 50%, whereas in Asian population, it is only 40%. So we Asians uh, uh, respond uh, less to only basal insulin therapy as far as uh, reaching the target A1C of less than 7% is concerned. So, important point is the component needs to be addressed uh, in Asian population. So, coming to the second point of uh, my today's agenda, insulin initiation and innovation of a two-in-one solution for total control. So I will talk with uh, the once daily IDEC expert that is the Rhizodac. It provides total control and suits the Indian reality of diabetes management. So the S part portion of the Rhizodac, it takes care of uh, the mealtime control of uh, the glycemic surges, whereas the Degudac part leads to a flat and stable glycemic control throughout the period of 24 hours. So uh, it is uh, a in one uh, insulin combination which can provide a total glycemic control in our Indian population. Now, when it comes to the uh, uh, insulin initiation, what does different guidelines suggest? So most of the international guidelines, they suggest that insulin initiation should be with the basal insulin. But let us uh, talk about uh, the RSSDI and Endocrine Society of India clinical practice recommendation as of 2020 because we are talking about the challenges we face uh, in our country in managing a diabetic patient. So let us discuss our own recommendation. And our own recommendation is uh, that we can initiate once daily with IDEC as part. And it is recommended as a choice of uh, insulin initiation along with uh, a basal insulin. So you may as well start with a formulation as a uh, 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 insulin initiation. And uh, some words of wisdom from uh, our guidelines that avoid using insulin as a threat in front of our patient and elevate the patient's anxiety about the insulin. 
So insulin therapy should be considered in all patients failing to achieve glycemic targets on three oral agents. And uh, I will come to the third point of my agenda, insulin therapy in local clinical practice, that is uh, our Indian scenario, making choice of an effective, safe and convenient option. So I will quote uh, the RCTs of uh, the IDEG as part. And this is the phase three clinical trial of uh, IDEG as part. And as you can see, uh, the phase three trial, uh, the IDEG as part has been extensively studied in both type one and type two diabetic patients. And it has been compared in different trials with insulin datimir, with uh, injection by Physic as part 30, with insulin large in U100, uh, compared with the basal insulin, with the insulin as part with this, that is the basal bolus therapy. And uh, it has been uh, studied as a uh, uh, insulin initiation after the OAD failures. So uh, it's a robust phase three uh, clinical trial program for IDEC as part. And uh, now, uh, despite uh, having uh, uh, from uh, uh, data from the phase three trials, uh, uh, there was a need for a uh, real world evidence uh, also for IDEC as part. And uh, the, this uh, real world evidence uh, was needed because uh, disease area characteristics and epidemiology and landscape should be taken into consideration. The product prescribing, that is the place in treatment algorithm versus the standard of care, real world effectiveness had to be studied, product safety had to be studied, prescribing characteristics, including dosing, patient profile, treatment adherence, and most importantly, economic and humanistic burden of the disease had to be studied. And uh, there is uh, a recent uh, publication of this trial, it is a real world evidence study, the uh, RI study, initiation and switch effectiveness study. And uh, improved glycemic control in people with type 2 diabetes initiating or switching to IDEC as part from any anti-hyperglycemic treatment in a real world setting across six countries were studied. So the patients studied were adults with type 2 diabetes, around 1000 plus patients uh, were studied in this uh, trial. And uh, in this study, IDEC as part was uh, prescribed as per local practice. So it was initiated on the first visit and then it was continued on the observation period and uh, uh, it was continued till uh, week uh, 26 to 36, that is the visit three. And that was also the end of the study visit. And the study information was, it was a non-informational study, only injection rhizodec was uh, either an initiator or added to ongoing therapy. Uh, Multi-center study, it was a prospective primary data collection study. Visit frequency was according to the local standard of care. The key inclusion criteria were physicians' decision to start treatment with the IDEC as part age of more than 18 years, diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and treated with any anti hyperglycemic treatment other than IDEC as part and available A1C value uh, less than 12 weeks of duration. And these were the participating countries. India was one of them, and you can see the other countries were Australia, Malaysia, Philippines, Saudi Arabia, and South Africa. These were the baseline characteristics. The mean age was uh, 58.6 years and the male-female ratio was equal. Body weight was a uh, mean 79.5 kgs. Duration of diabetes was mean 13.3 years. BMI was mean 29.2. Fasting plasma glucose was uh, 198 mean and mean A1C was 9.8%. So you can see the baseline characteristics of the patient, it matches with the routine patients, uh, we are seeing a uh, daily in our OPDs. So it is uh, more of a real world uh, patients uh, that were studied in this uh, um, trial. These are the previous anti hyperglycemic treatment. So patients only on OEDs, 35% uh, basal, only insulin, 21.8%, GLP1 receptor agonist, 8%, basal bolus therapy, 13%, and premix. Uh, 
uh, 20 point, 20, uh, uh, 21.9%. So out of this, the Rhizodec was uh, initiated or added to the ongoing OAD therapy and ongoing GSP-1 receptor agonist therapy and the basal insulin, basal bolus insulin and premix insulin was replaced by the injection rhizodec. Now, this was the uh, percentage of uh, the patients given once daily or twice daily rhizodec. It, uh, uh, it was left to the discretion of the uh, investigator to give once daily or twice daily rhizodec. And you can see almost uh, it was 50-50 once daily uh, versus twice daily rhizodec by different uh, investigators. In RIs, IDEC as part was used as both once and twice daily injections. Now, what was the reason for starting IDEC as part treatment by various uh, investigators? So you can see the most common cause was to improve the patient's glycemic control. So despite uh, multiple OADs, despite uh, OADs plus basal therapy, despite uh, OADs plus basal bolus, despite OADs plus GFP1 receptor agonist, the patients were having IHV1C and hence the investigators decided to uh, initiate them or replace uh, the ongoing insulin with the insulin rhizodec To lower the risk of hypoglycemia, flexibility in the dosing regime and fewer injections than basal bolus therapy were other reasons. So improved glycemic control, lower risk of hypoglycemia, advantage of flexibility and newer uh, for fewer injections were common reasons for starting insulin rhizodec. Now these are the results. Change in A1C from baseline. So overall, the HP1C reduction was 1.4 percent. In Indian patients, it was 1.6 percent, and uh, in Saudi Arabian patients, it was 2 percent. But overall, throughout uh, different uh, countries, all six countries, significant reduction was seen for mean change in A1C from baseline across, overall across all countries. Now, uh, change in is HbA1c uh, depending on the uh, treatment subgroup or baseline therapy. So again, overall HbA1c reduction, as I mentioned, was 1.4 percent in patients who were only on OEDs and in whom injection rhizodec was added to ongoing therapy. The HbA1c reduction was maximum 2 percent, but there was also a significant HbA1c reduction in patients who were only patients on GLP1 receptor agonist, the patients on basal bolus therapy. So significant reduction was seen for mean change in A1C from baseline overall and across treatment subgroups. Now, change in fasting plasma glucose from baseline, again, you can see um, across different countries, there was significant reduction in the fasting plasma glucose. Overall, it was around 49 milligram per cent. In Indian population, it was 52 milligram per cent. Now, talking about the non-severe hypoglycemic events. So, here we can see there was lower risk of non-severe hypoglycemic events on treatment with IDEC as part. So, here we can see this is uh, on the left side, you can see the rates of hypoglycemia pre-treatment uh, with rhizodec, and on right side, rates of uh, hypoglycemia prior to end of study. So you can see there was significant reduction in all categories except uh, in the category of uh, uh, the patients where the rhizodec was added to ongoing GFP1 receptor agonist therapy. There was significant reduction in the events of the hypoglycemia. So you can see the number of events uh, reduced from 364 to 162. Now, what about the severe hypoglycemic events? So again, you can see there was lower risk of severe hypoglycemic events uh, seen on treatment with IDEC as part. So in all categories, in OAD, basal, GLP-1 receptor, one is premix and basal bolus therapy, there was significant uh, reduction in severe hypoglycemia and the event rate uh, came down significantly from 51 to 3. Now, talking about resource utilization. So, there was significant improvement in self-reported outpatient visits by the patient, self-reported reported emergency room visits, and self-reported work days missed by the patients who were either initiated or from insulin to insulin rhizodec. So, there was significant reduction seen for resource utilization.
and the conclusion of this trial was in a right study initiation with or switching to idec as part led to effective hb1c reduction 1.6 hb1c reduction in indian cohort effective fasting plasma glucose control improved safety in terms of lower risk of hypoglycemic events and better resource utilization in terms of significant reduction in the outpatient visits as well as self reported work days missed after isodectric So thank you